Chapter 11, Quinn. Willie was dragging his ass again on Wednesday morning, but truthfully, it wasn't all his fault. I was kind of dragging my ass too, still dwelling on all the things I'd been talking to Jill about the night before. It's not like I was dreaming about it. It was more that weird state where your eyes are closed and you know you're thinking, and it feels like you're both asleep and not, like you're resting, but still thinking, kind of in control of your thoughts and kind of not. Well, the days carried right over into morning like I was sleepwalking, and when Willie and I finally made it down the steps to head off to school, it might as well have been a dream, because standing on the sidewalk a few houses down, having just lugged the garbage to the street, was Paul Galuzzo, staring right at me. He waved to me, and I waved back, automatically, out of habit. What was I doing? He jogged up to us, and I kept thinking, all I had to do was turn and walk away. What the hell is wrong with me? He looked like he hadn't slept in days. Maybe he hadn't. Maybe he'd been up all night too, thinking about what he'd done to Rashad. Poor guy. Yep, that was my first actual thought. Not Rashad. Paul. Jesus. What's up, Collins? He said when he got to us. Ah, hey, I mumbled. All the normalcy was gone. He sniffled. And I wasn't sure if it was one of those things a guy like him did before he socked a guy like me in the face. I gripped Willie's hand. Paul tussled Willie's hair. He glanced back and forth between Willie and me, and I focused on the grease stains on Paul's t-shirt. Hey, he said, I thought we were going to practice some footwork. He didn't sound angry, more like he was pleading. I'm right here, man. Yeah, I said again, fishing for words. Look, I know uh, it's been busy and we have to get to school all and all. And hey, he said now with more force, don't bullshit me. This made Willie jump a little and Paul calmed down. No, listen, he said easy like old times. Lil Guz has been telling me all about the chatter at school. Nah, I said, not sure what to say. It's nothing. No, Paul said. It's No, it's not. It's weird. I know it. He hesitated, and I couldn't find a word to fill the silence. I just wanted to turn and run, but I had Willie holding me there like an anchor. Or maybe it was me. What the hell did I want him to say? You got to hear my side of the story. That was the last thing I wanted to do. Uh, I know, I stuttered, but no, listen, you do. Paul clamped my shoulder with his hand. He raised the other one slowly and pointed close to my face, scab still tattooing his knuckles. Because you were there, I know. Willie looked up at me. What's going on? Paul sniffled again. His eyes were bloodshot, his hair a mess. He was wearing flip-flops. I'd never seen him in those stupid things. He let go of me and stood back, his hands on his hips. Look, he said, people tell a lot of messed up stories. People are talking about me. Well, I'm telling you this. There was a woman in the store. This kid took her down because she caught him stealing. I went in to protect her and then he went after me, okay? He wiped a hand over his head and then held his fist in front of his mouth for a moment. What was I supposed to do? It's my job, Quinn. I was protecting the lady. I was just doing my job. He reached out to me again, but didn't grab me. Just kind of touched my shoulder like he wasn't sure what he was doing. I leaned back and his fingers fell away awkwardly. I know, I lied, I hear you. Do you? Paul's face was all screwed up. I don't think you do, Quinn. What the hell's the matter with you, man? I know, it's just, I couldn't find anything else to say. I have to get this guy to school, I nodded to Willie. Catch you later though, right? Paul's look of disgust ripped a hole in my chest. Are you serious, Quinn? I shrugged and Paul narrowed his eyes. Yeah, he said, turning around and waving me off. See you later. But really, it sounded, it was like, he was saying to hell with you. And for the whole walk to Willie's middle school and then to my school, all I could hear was that lie in his voice. He didn't want to see me later. No way. I didn't want to see him either. But what was worse was that I couldn't believe he told me about what happened in the store. Or actually, it wasn't that I couldn't believe that he told me. It was that I didn't believe what he told me. Because even if Rashad did everything Paul said he did, really? Well, I saw what I saw on the street. That was the real story. I met Jill on the front steps by the tag. What had once been a non-hang at the school had now become the hang at the school. Everybody stood around the spray painted slogan. The school maintenance crew hadn't washed it off and what made it all more powerful was that it still was true. Rashad had been in the hospital five nights and he was still there. Rashad was absent again today. On, the either, on either side of the spray paint, kids passed out flyers. A black fist rose from the bottom of each sheet and called for justice. 
It was what Jill had been talking about. She was organizing, getting involved, and she was there with Tiffany, handing them out. I didn't have Mr. Fisher for history like they did, but I knew who he was, and I saw him out there too, his bright white head bobbing through the crowd of students. Jill now told me in detail what was going down. A community group, a church, and some of the students clubs at school were planning a protest march on Friday. It would start at the west side, uh, go right by Jerry's, and wind its way through the town to City Hall and Police Plaza One. The march through town would begin at 5.30 p.m., approximately the same time Rashad had been arrested for petty theft, resisting arrest, and public nuisance, whatever the hell that meant. And just as I was thinking it, I heard someone else ask it. Will Rashad be there? Nobody knew. At the bell, Jill and I took off in different directions. I tried to catch up with Toombs, but he ignored me and hustled ahead of me into our English classroom. When I walked into class behind him, Miss Tracy stood at the window, looking down over the front steps into the entrance to the school. Even when everybody had taken their seat, she remained by the window and the rest of the class kept talking, waiting for her to go to her desk. But she didn't. In her hand, she held her copy of the novel, Invisible Man. A week earlier, she'd made photocopies of the first chapter, a short story by Ralph Ellison published as Battle Royal. That story, I'd never read anything like it. The violence, the all-out warfare, the N-word all over the place. When it had been assigned a week earlier, I read it all twisted up in discomfort, like the actual reading of the story was painful. But now, as Mrs. Tracy clutched her book and looked, out, looked down to the sidewalk, a kind of nervousness rose in me. I hated the way the old white men in the story had acted, watching black boys getting beaten, beating each other for sport, and I put just as much distance between them and me as I could. I wasn't them, I told myself as I read. White people were crazy back then. 80 years ago when the story took place, not now. But watching Mrs. Tracy stare out the window, a weight of dread dropped through me. We were going to talk about the story again after Rashad, or were we going to talk about the story again after Rashad? Because after what had happened to Rashad, it felt like no time had passed at all. It could have been 80 years ago or only eight. Now it wasn't only the city aldermen. Now there were vi the videos and we were all watching this ha happen over and over on our TVs and phones, shaking our heads, but doing nothing about it. Mrs. Tracy still didn't move from the window and everyone began to fidget, looking at everyone else. And my eyes landed on the whiteboard. Her notes from what must have been her last period class the day before were still on it active versus passive voice. I remembered the exact same lesson from ninth grade. I thought it was all a pain in the butt, but what had once been a stupid grammar lesson now formed a weird lump in my throat. Mistakes were made, Mrs. Tracy had scrawled, and beneath it she'd written, who, who made the mistakes? In my mind, I ran through the exercise I remembered from the time, rearranging the phrases, making something passive, active. But this time I found myself changing the other words too, because I was clearly becoming obsessed, even if I didn't want to be. Mistakes were made. Rashad was beaten. Paul beat Rashad. Mrs. Tracy finally moved from the window and did something just as surprising. She da sat down behind her desk. She usually walked around her desk or she perched on the front of her desk, but she never sat. Now, slumped behind it, she'd never looked so small. The whiteboard as big as the sky over her tiny hunched shoulders. I thought she was about to begin the lesson, but she pushed the book away from her on the desk and began to cry. I clenched my jaw tight and stared down at the floor, trying not to let her tears make me cry back in response. I just sat there breathing heavily through my nose. She pointed to the window and dropped her head into her hands. I don't want to see this happen to any of my students, she said, clutching her breath. I don't want to believe it still happens. I gripped one hand with the other, hoping to disappear. I wasn't the only one. The room had never been so quiet. No one spoke or whispered. Mrs. Tracy just sat there with her head in her hands. After a few last sobs, she apologized. I'm sorry for my outburst. It's just, and then the tears came again, and she apologized again and continued. Mr. Godwin thinks it's best if I don't assign papers for this story. He thinks it's best to just move on to the next unit. Something felt off about that. Don't get me wrong, nobody wants to write a paper if he doesn't have to, but this time it felt like we were getting cheated out of something. Everyone still kept absolutely silent, but I wondered what was going through Toom's mind. He was nodding a slow, hesitant nod, and I read you kind of nod. 
I leaned back in my chair, but I couldn't actually go anywhere because the damn thing was all one unit. I felt trapped. It was too damn small for me anyway. And I was sitting there shifting around in my tiny ass chair desk. I remembered Mrs. Tracy making fun of Mr. Godwin saying she'd never follow what the department head or the administrations wanted her to teach. But now suddenly when they actually did direct her, she was blaming them for not talking about the book. And then I thought about what was right there in the text, Ralph Ellison talking about invisibility, not the wacky science fiction kind, but the kind where people are looking at you, but not seeing you looking through you or around you. Like why the hell shouldn't our classes be talking about what happened to Rashad? What uh, was what happened to him invisible? Was he invisible? I scribbled a note. I might be an asshole, but I know this isn't right. Should we do something? The Invisible Man at Central High, Rashad. I tore the note from my notebook, wadded it, and threw it at Tombs. The crumbled ball bounced off his desk on, into his chest and onto the ground. He squinted at me. Read it, I mouthed. He hesitated, but then he snatched it up and smoothed it out. He stared at the note for what seemed like forever, and then he looked back up at me. You with me? He mouthed back. I nodded. Then, for the first time ever in any class I'd ever been in with him, Tombs spoke up without being called on. Battle Royal, he said, pulling his, out his photocopy of his folder for Rashad. And he began to read. It goes a long way back, some 20 years. All my life, I'd been looking for something. And everywhere I turned, someone tried to tell me what it was. Now Tombs is not a read out loud kind of guy, but he went right into it, reading clear and confident for the whole room to hear. And it made the most perfect sense reading the words Ralph Ellison had written years ago. Mrs. Tracy lifted her head, her face a mess, and something about her crying there in class made me so so mad. Like Rashad's reality meant now she couldn't talk about the story or didn't know how, but there was Ralph Ellison and Tombs too, just telling us what we needed to do. I unfolded my crinkled page and followed along as Tombs read aloud, ending with the final line of the first paragraph. It took me a long time and much painful boomeranging in my expectations to achieve the realization everyone else appears to have been born with, that I'm a nobody but myself. But first I had to discover that I am an invisible man. When Tombs fell silent, I glanced back and I realized he was looking at me. I nodded and even though I'm not the kind of guy who likes to read aloud either, I hate it. The rest of the room just sat there waiting for something to happen. Even Mrs. Tracy was stunned. So I jumped into the next paragraph. The lines were the old grandfather's deathbed advice, talking about his life after slavery, his life still struggling. Learn it to the young'uns, his final uh, fiercely whispered words. And it seems like the words were calling right into the classroom. They weren't my words, they were Ellison's, but there he was reminding us all what had to be learned by the young'uns. Then it was my time to be surprised because Nam picked up where I left off and after Nam, Sonia read, then Latrice and Alex. And soon it was clear the whole class was going to take a turn because what would it say if you didn't? Mrs. Tracy watched and listened. She didn't interrupt. The slurs and the violence from the dialogue ricocheted around the room. Some people skipped over them. Some people said line of dialogue. Chloe looked up, tears streaming down her own white face and said, I don't want to say these words and nobody judged. We just waited to see what she would do. Some people said it all word for word, but here are the words that kept ricocheting around me all day. Nobody says the words anymore, but somehow the violence still remains. If I didn't want the violence to remain, I had to do a hell of a lot more than just say the right things and not say the wrong things. Practice was better than it had been in a couple of days. Coach drilled us with a few plays, then made us run laps, then dropped the three-point contest on us. It was no surprise that I won because I'd been hitting three since I was a freshman. I used my legs to shoot like Paul had taught me, but I didn't think about him as I shot. I kept my head where it was supposed to be in the moment, even when we scrimmaged. Coach was trying out different combinations of players, and although he didn't say it, he was evaluating who was going to be a starter for sure. At first I played against English, then I got SWAT briefly, and when I went back in, I was on his team. I was nervous, but a shooter has to shoot. I hit the first one, I took a pass on from him, and on the very next play, we had a two-on-one against Tombs, and although English might have taken it to the hoop against Tombs, he kicked it to me for the easy basket. I got him later, too, when I dropped the ball 
around Guzo, English and I had a rhythm going, and I knew that if we kept it up for the next few months, we'd both be breaking records. I mean, hell, why couldn't the scouts be here now when English and I were playing so well together? But no game is ever that easy. Ten minutes before practice was supposed to end, Guzo and Toombs went up for a rebound, and Toombs knocked Guzo in the face with his elbow. Guzo bucked backwards, spun, and stumbled down to one knee. Coach blew his whistle and we all stopped, but already Guzo was springing to his feet and shoving Toombs. Toombs pushed him back and Nam and I got in between them before either of them threw a punch. What the hell's the matter with you two, Coach barked. He pulled us apart and for a split second, it seemed like Guzo and Toombs were going to go at it again. But Coach got each of them by the collars of their shirts. There's no room for that bullshit out here. He jacked me, Guzo said, a line of blood dropped from his nose and onto his shirt. It was an accident, Toombs said. No, it wasn't, Guzo shot back. Enough, Coach told them, letting go of their shirts. Take it easy, he stared at Toombs. It was an accident, right? Of course. Bullshit, Guzo interrupted. Everyone has it out for me. Coach rubbed his jaw. All right, look. Enough of that. He looked around at all of us. You think it's dumb when someone says there's no I in team, but you stick one in there and you see how dumb that looks? Guzo stepped back, but coach waved him in closer. Bring it in, boys, we all hesitated. I said, bring it in, he yelled. So we piled in around him and he stuck his hand in the middle. We followed like we always did. I get it, there's a lot of BS out there and it needs to get resolved, but we're not resolving it in here, not in practice and not on this court. We leave all that BS at the door. In here on this court, we need to win games. That's all we need to do, and we need to work like one team or we're screwed. Do you hear me? We've got all kinds of people coming to see us. They start coming next week. Next week. You ready for that? The press, the scouts. When is the last time those guys from Duke were here? You guys hear me? A couple of guys said yes, but the rest of us merely nodded. Guzzo leaned on my back, but I was looking across the circle at English and Shannon. I got what Coach was saying. I wanted to see teammates, but it got me thinking. Maybe right now all I saw were teammates around me, but once we step back into the real world, who did I see? Who did they see? Coach could keep shouting at us until we all parroted back what he wanted, but I knew English and Shannon answered because they had to, not because they wanted to. Tombs too, and that's what I was going, and that's what I was doing too, because Coach kept telling us to leave everything else at the door. But I was thinking about it the other way around. How did the team stay a team back out the door? How did the team stay a team out in the street? Guzzo's nose kept bleeding right through all the yelling, so Coach told me to go get him in the locker room and cleaned up. Then Coach blew his whistle. The scrimmage started again with new combinations and the, squeak, and the squeaking of sneakers and the ball on the court followed me into the locker room. Guzzo jogged ahead of me, not saying a word, while he washed his face and grabbed a couple paper towels. He was walking around to a bench deeper in the locker room, sat down, and held his head back. I leaned against a nearby locker and crossed my arms. He didn't hit you on purpose. Yeah, he did. Come on. People have it all backwards. They do, Guzzo said. He wiped his nose and then pinched it closed again. Look, he said, I'm sorry, but my brother did the right thing. He has to make tough calls. I'm sorry they're friends with that guy. But what are you going to do? I mean, Paul, he was helping the woman in the store. He didn't do anything wrong. He was doing his job. But that's not how everyone sees it, man. Yeah, but that doesn't mean they're right. Yeah, but, but what? Guzzo wiped his nose again and raised his voice. But what? Whose side are you on here? Come on, you heard coach. I said no sides. No sides? Are you kidding me? Of course there are sides. There are two sides to every situation. His nose started bleeding again, so I got him another paper towel. He wiped at his nose again. It still bled. I got him another paper towel, but he just held it in his hand. They could call you for a witness, couldn't they? Maybe, I said. I was feeling paranoid about this because ever since my conversation with Jill, I kept thinking that I had to do it. I had to let someone know. And then what, stand in a courtroom and point my finger at Paul? I couldn't even imagine doing that. I don't know how it works though, I continued. Anyway, everyone's seen the video. It was all taken from a spot closer than I was. But if they called you, what would you say? I was silent. Before anybody would call me into some freaking courtroom, I'd have to tell somebody official that I was there. Whose side are you on? Guzzo asked. And even when I didn't answer him, he continued, everybody's got to get their heads out of their butts. We're not a team of tombs or anybody else is going to clock me every chance he gets. No, man. The problem is assuming he's out to get you. He isn't. 
Guzzo pinched his nose again and tipped his head back. I don't need a nurse, he said. Get out of here. I know whose side you're on. And I'm going to tell my brother how you don't have his back. After all he did for you, man, go to hell. He stood and I backed away. Even with a bloody nose, Guzzo could drop me in a heartbeat. It's about doing the right thing, Guzzo said mockingly. I hate all this politically correct BS. Nobody'd be spray painting your name on the sidewalk if Paul had grabbed you coming out of Jerry's. He punched a locker with the side of his fist. Half the school's calling my brother a racist. He was just doing his job. People throw that word racist around all the time now. Pretty soon everyone's going to start calling me a racist if I don't pass to the ball. It's BS and you know it. Guzzo, I said, you're not the victim. Your brother isn't either. The look on his face went fierce, and I was glad as hell that Coach began bringing the rest of the team into the locker room. He called out to us, and we reluctantly joined him and the rest of the guys around the bench closest to the showers. One more time, bring it in, boys, Coach said. We're all in this together. He looked at Guzzo, then at Toombs. Sorry, Toombs said to Guzzo through his teeth. Galuzzo, Coach prompted. Yeah, yeah, Guzzo said, me too and then he pulled the bloody paper towel away from his face and wadded it into a hard ball. We're good, right? He said across the circle to Tombs. He smiled sarcastically. If the rest of us had melted away and Coach had disappeared, I think Tombs would have leapt across the bench and punched Guzzo straight in the face for real this time, and I wouldn't have blamed him. But what the hell? Didn't that make me a traitor to my best friend? Hey, I said to Guzzo, it's over. Guzzo glared at me, damn straight, he said. That's right, Coach said, and we're a team and we need to take care of each other. You know the rules. We take care of each other on the court and off it. We don't go to parties and we help make sure no one else on the team goes to them either. No one needs to be stupid. We have four months to show the world we're number one. No parties and no protests. You hear me? Some of the guys nodded. I said, you hear me? Yes, we yelled automatically. Mean it. Yes. Again. Yes. He stuck his hand and we followed it. Okay. Team on three. One, two, three. Team, we all shouted, lying just to get the damn practice finished. Team, maybe. Like the whole school is a team. The whole city is a team. But we weren't one just because we called ourselves one. We had to mean it to be it. And to be it, maybe we had to talk about the tough crap out loud. Otherwise, we just keep lying to each other all the time. Lying. Paul wasn't the only one.